Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Caroline, I'm a rising senior at Columbia University and today I'm going to be filming another Columbia specific Q&A as part of an ongoing series. So if you haven't watched the first few Q&As, I will link them in the description below as a playlist and also link a couple of them up here. I also wanted to thank you guys if you guys are continuing watchers or if you're first time viewers of the channel. Thank you for supporting the channel. I think it's really great to see the community that has been built around that and it's just very sweet to see that people have gone into Columbia and are excited for it and then people kind of commenting below that congratulating and it's, it's very wholesome. So thank you and let's get started. So the first question comes from Louisa and she asks, what is the maximum number of classes you've taken in a semester? Do you recommend that many? That is a great question because it's always difficult to predict how many classes you're able to handle, especially if you're just going into your first year. So the max number of classes I've taken is six plus two recitations because I had two STEM lecture courses that semester. I don't know if you would count those as classes, but yeah, if you don't, then it's six. If you do, then it's eight. I think six classes is definitely manageable if you are efficient with your time and you don't have too much going on outside of classes, right? Because college is not just about classes. It's also about extracurricular activities, student organizations, making new friends, also possibly carrying a job outside of all your classwork and everything else. So I think it depends on each individual person. And I would also say don't feel pressured to take six classes. The maximum credit limit is 18 credits per semester for Columbia College, and I think it's 21 credits per semester for Columbia Engineering. So that is around four to five classes or six classes, depending on the number of credits per class that you take. It also depends on what kind of classes you're taking, right? So if you're taking like a yoga class, it's one credit, pass fail, but it also counts as a class. So it really is relative to what your schedule course load is like. I think also one thing to keep in mind when considering the number of classes is the number of times a week that the class meets. A lot of the core classes and a lot of the lecture classes meet twice a week for one hour and 15 minutes each, at least at Columbia. But some classes only meet once a week but for a longer period of time. And then before the next class, like the next week, you have a set of readings to do or problem sets to do and that happens outside of the classroom. Also, I mentioned that I had two recitation classes for two lecture classes that I had been taking, so biology and physics. A biology recitation is two hours once a week and then physics recitation is one hour a week. So you wanna make sure that you are also considering those recitation time slots because sometimes it's last minute, you forget to sign up for a recitation and then you realize that you need to make room in your schedule for those. So it really depends on a case by case basis. I'd also highly recommend that you speak to your advisor about this because they have a lot of experience scheduling for a lot of students. So hopefully they will provide some insights that are particular to you. If you're interested in seeing if you can handle a certain number of classes, you can also sign up for that number of classes and then before the add drop deadline, which happens a few weeks into the semester, you can decide whether you wanna stay or if you wanna drop the class. So if you drop before that add drop deadline, then you will be able to drop out of the class without having it show up on your transcript. But if you wait until later in the semester to decide not to take the class, it might still show up on your transcript. So just make sure to check in on the policies on that. Okay, so second question. Just signed up, could you please share your productivity tips for online school? Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, Leona, for the question. What Leona is referencing with the signing up is that I just started a newsletter. So I officially started and debuted my newsletter. Please, please, please make sure to sign up for my newsletter. Link in the description below. It'll be a way for me to keep in touch with you guys and just build a community around writing as well as around videos. Um, I think this is gonna be a great way for me to share daily insights that I learned from life inside and outside of the classroom, study tips, productivity tips, and just like personal development advice that I've gained either from reading or from experience. So yeah, thank you for including that in your comment. Productivity tips for online school. The first thing I would say is to make sure that you set habits for yourself. I'm calling these habits and not strategies because I feel like these are ways of life that you can incorporate into online learning, but also into in-person learning and outside of the classroom as a whole. So the first thing I would say is to make sure you get enough sleep. As much as you learn and as much as you read and as much as you study, 
you won't be able to consolidate that information without sleep because evidence has shown that sleep is when consolidation actually happens. In addition to sleep, I also recommend exercise. I know this might seem a little bit obvious, but I think exercising is super important, not only for your physical health, but for your mental health as well. Definitely with online learning, there's a lot of sitting going on. Try to find a way to combat that sitting, either by finding an area where you can put your laptop and stand to take your classes, um, I think that helps alternating sitting and standing as well. Even though I'm still in college, I already feel the back pains that come with sitting for a long time. The last tip I wanted to give for being productive in online school is something called productive procrastination or structured procrastination. And I know this term and this idea has been is a little bit controversial because some people think that Productive procrastination is really just pushing off the most important things and getting things that are not that important done. For example, if you have a really big test that you should be studying for, but then you spend the night before cleaning your room or washing the dishes, that is productive in a sense that you are cleaning and that you are doing things that maybe you should be doing a little bit after your test, but it's not productive in the fact that you are pushing off studying for the next day. But for me, I kind of think of productive procrastination as a way to stay productive. You can use productive procrastination to your advantage by framing it as a sort of structured procrastination. I'll link some articles below on structured procrastination if you want to learn more. But the overall gist is that it's not whether or not you procrastinate because everyone procrastinates to some sense, but it's what you do in that time that you're procrastinating, right? So if I am procrastinating by watching YouTube videos, that's kind of a little bit unproductive. I know sometimes it's necessary to just relax your mind and indulge in these like hobbies of watching TV and everything. But when you're trying to get work done, it's more helpful to, for example, procrastinate by reading a book or by listening to an audiobook if your eyes are strained from looking at the screen for so long. Choosing the proper activities to procrastinate on is actually helpful for maintaining productivity in the long run because after you do those activities that you really want to do, when you go back to working on your essay, you'll not only be a little bit more willing to work on your essay because you've taken a break from it, but you're coming back to it with a set of fresh eyes and a fresh mind, and you'll be able to just be a little bit more objective with your own work. So if you get anything from this segment of the video, it's to choose wisely the set of tasks that you use as your procrastination tools. Okay, so the next question is from Glenda. What is your current major? So my current major is medical humanities. I mentioned this a little bit before in my other Q&A video where I declared my major. So at that time, I declared my major in medicine, literature, and society. Technically, at that time, it wasn't a full major. It was a track under the comparative literature major. But good news that this past academic year, medical humanities has officially become its own major at Columbia, which is really exciting because that means it's, it's been approved and everything. Let me know in the comments below if you want me to talk a little bit more about my major because I think it's a pretty cool interdisciplinary option for anyone interested in the sciences, but also the humanities. Okay, so the next question comes from Burkan Otlik. How do dual enrollment credits transfer at Columbia and do you need to send transcripts of any type? Also, I love your vids, thank you. <laughs> so I personally don't have experience with dual enrollment credits, but kudos to you because that means that you've taken college level classes in high school and that's really great. I did a quick search on Columbia's FAQ page and college credit taken before graduation from high school or secondary school is not transferable to Columbia, but if you did take college classes after you graduated high school and before you matriculated into Columbia, those can be counted for a maximum of six credits. Another way that you can get credit for college level classes is if you took AP or IB courses. So depending on the scores you get, you will be able to get a certain number of credits. Sometimes the credits are just awarded to you, but sometimes you have to take a course after that, like a more advanced course after that to get a certain number of credits. I will link the bulletin to Columbia College and Columbia Engineering down below just so you are able to get a more specific answer if you're looking for that. So the next question that we have is from Tara or Tara. Can you talk a little about Barnard's relationship with Columbia? I'm most likely going there in the fall and I'm super excited to learn more. So yay, congrats on Barnard. At least personally, I feel like everything is pretty integrated because Columbia students can take Barnard classes, Barnard students can take Columbia classes, the 
Administration though is a little bit separate. So the campuses are separate, but they're like literally right across the street from each other. Um, there are different libraries, but you can come, to, Barnard students can come to Columbia libraries and Columbia students can go to Barnard libraries, which are super nice by the way. They have standing desks that move up and down by just like pushing a button, which I think is super cool. Um, and that was the first time I ever saw a standing desk was in Milstein library. So yeah, highly recommend check that out when you get to campus. Also, Barnard students and Columbia students are part of the same clubs and student organizations, sororities, anything you can really think of on campus. I feel like Barnard students and Columbia students are in together. Even though the residence hall situations are kind of separated, you can still apply to live in, like Columbia students can apply to live in Barnard housing, Barnard students can apply to live in Columbia housing under given circumstances. I don't think it's very common, but I feel like I've heard of that happening before. And you'll constantly see Barnard students and Columbia students on each other's campus. Because the classes are very integrated, you'll be able to make friends from all the undergraduate colleges. Also, something important is that we actually do have two different mascots. So Barnard's mascot is Millie the Dancing Bear, and then Columbia is Rory the Lion. Okay, so the next question is from Bilgun. How is your university participating in division championships, and where's the soccer field? So, I do believe that all Ivy League schools, including Columbia, are Division I schools. Our soccer field is actually not on the Morningside campus, so the Morningside campus is where the undergraduates take their classes and live. Soccer field is actually up at Baker, which is at 218th Street. So we are at 116th Street and kind of like a square or rectangle campus around that. Um, and you can take a bus or you can take the subway up to 200 something street in order to get to the athletic complex. That's also where the football players play their games, their home games at least, it's up at Baker complex. Um, but for basketball and sports like that, we actually do have our basketball court is on the Morningside campus in the in the gym, in the Levain Gymnasium. So it's pretty close. The last question that we have for today is from Grace. Hi, Caroline. How can an international student get to Columbia University? I love you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your support. For me personally, I'm not an international student, so I can't give a personal perspective on this. I'm sure that as an international student, you probably have your own reasons for coming to the US to study. And you probably have your own passions and your own story that needs to be told. As with any application in your personal statement, definitely let that shine through, right? Let your background shine through because even though some things might seem mundane to yourself, coming from an international background to an American university, there's definitely a lot of diversity that you can bring. As with anything, it's always nice to draw connections between things that you're involved in and things that you want to be involved in in the future. Just build a story around your own life experiences and I think hopefully that helps. Those are all the questions that I have for today. Please let me know if you have any more questions down in the comments below or you can go back and post on the community post that I made. I always really appreciate these questions because these are questions that I had as a first year that I wish that someone would just like personally tell me the answer to. I also wanted to last minute plug my podcast. The podcast is composed of interview style conversation between me and another college student. And these college students are pretty exceptional. <laughs> they are entrepreneurs, they are advocates. They're available on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and of course YouTube. And I just hope that these are helpful in preparing you for college and for understanding the different perspectives and different types of people that you'll meet in college, which is really exciting. Again, sign up for my newsletter, please. Thank you. And I'll see you guys in the next video. <laughs> Bye.